Good morning. Good morning. Okay. It's time for offerings. Give whatever God puts on your heart. We thank you for your support, your love, your prayer, um, every seed that you've sown into this place. Um, know that it has not gone unnoticed, and we just thank you for all y'all do for God manifesting for God. We are selling hats. We have these embroidered hats, 20 bucks a piece. We only have a few of them left, so if y'all are interest, interested, let us know. All right, so April 25th, we're doing a prophecy in potluck. Sign up for your dish with Olivia or I. Uh, men text me, women text Olivia. Um, we love to have you all come. Again, it's going to be April 25th. Um, invite friends. They don't have to bring food. We'll, we'll prophesy to them, we'll feed them, and we'll love them. So we look forward to that. On May 5th, we have Rick Lyons coming out. He's a, a hardcore Christian rock uh, rocker and worshiper. So come out and enjoy that. And also, the day after that is Olivia's birthday, May 6th. So on the 5th, we're going to go out and celebrate Olivia's birthday. We, she hasn't chosen a restaurant yet. Um, we're just going to love my wife. She's amazing. And um, we're just going to have a good time. We're going to rock out, worship, and celebrate her birthday. So it's going to be a great, great day. On June 16th, we have Mitko and Albina. They're, uh, they're missionaries um, from Bulgaria. Uh, Bulgaria is a socialist, communist-type country. And um, his stories are amazing. So they'll be out on June 16th. That's a Sunday. We look forward to seeing you there. All right, that's it. So I just wanted to start off with Proverbs 11.20. I'm reading from the NLT first. The Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but he delights in those with integrity. So today's sermon is titled Heart Matters. The matters of the heart and the importance of the heart, the decisions you make. We were created to be lamps, right? To shine God's light through, through the revealing of him and his goodness in this, into this dark world. So wherever we go, we should be constantly looking to shine and point out God even in the midst of hardship or the midst of celebration. We're called to be motivated not by reaping rewards on earth, but we're called to be rewarded, to, to reap our rewards from heaven. So this verse in Proverbs makes it so clear that motives, that the motives that we have are more important than the actions that we do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, basically, Our reason for doing something is more important than our act of actually doing that deed. So I'm going to read this passage again. This time in the Passion Translation. Again, this is Proverbs 11.20, now in the Passion. It says, the Lord can't stand a stubborn heart bent towards evil, but he treasures those ways that are pure. So in the first version, it was NLT, where it states that God detests crooked hearts. And in the Passion Translations, it states that God cannot stand a stubborn heart bent towards evil. Crooked and stubbornness will really hold us back from seeing the glory of God through our life. It won't stop it, but it will hinder our walk, hinder how God uses us, and hinder how God flows through us. And then in the LNT, what does God love and delight on? He says he delights in those with integrity. It says in the NLT. In the Passion Translation, it says God treasures those whose ways are pure. Now I'll turn to Psalms 37, 4. I'm reading from the King James right now. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. It's very poetic. The King James is very poetic. So I'll share this once before. So the word delight in this instance, where it says that delight thy heart, the word delight actually means in Hebrew, soft and pliable. So when you're studying a scripture, it's important, like Dennis and I were just talking about studying scriptures and the different versions just on Friday. When you study scripture, it's, it's great to go back to the root word, the root definition, what it means in context and what it also means um, in, in, in their culture at that time. So when you do that, what you do is you take the definition and you plug it in to those words. These words are very important. When you plug it in, it really unlocks more of God. 
So in this instance, I'm going to replace the word delight with soft and pliable. It says, if you are soft and pliable in the Lord, he shall give you desires of your heart. And I was taught earlier on that, and that's the first time I heard that scripture, I was probably a year old Christian. And God says, the guy says, no, Jonathan, you're reading it wrong. He's not giving you the, whatever you, you desire, but he's placing desires into your heart. He's placing his desires into your heart. If you're soft, if you're soft, moldable, pliable, God can basically transform you into whatever he sees you as becoming. So the softer and more pliable we are, the easier it is for God to mold us like a piece of clay and transform us into the person or into our destiny of our, of our heavenly being. And the goal as Christianity is to be Christ-like. So our goal is for him to mold us, our actions, our intentions, our hearts, our minds, our wills and emotions, and mold that into Christ-likeness. You know, God said to me once, you know, he says, everything you do, Jonathan, either glorifies me and builds my kingdom or glorifies the enemy and builds his kingdom. Yep. Everything you do. How, it scared me to death and it should scare us because how often have I done things out of selfish motives? You know, I'm a pastor, but occasionally I do things out of selfish motives. You know, I'm human. I'm married, you know, and, you know, when you when you do things out of selfish motives, I'm not building the kingdom of God. I'm helping the enemy brick by brick build his kingdom. The so God's glory. God's glory is found in our submission to his vision. And our ability to quickly adapt to God's plan. Have you ever been inconvenienced by God yeah. only mm -hmm. to come to an end where you're, where you're shocked by the miracle that happens? I have. So in the kingdom of God, reckless obedience will make you into a wrecking ball for the kingdom of heaven. The more recklessly obedient you are to God, the bigger the impact he can make through you. As you know, I was saved in 2003, about three months into my salvation. I was reading the Bible, hearing God's, God's voice, and trying my best to include him in all I did. I came from a Buddhist background, so it's a little different than a lot of others. So in my daily activities, I kept myself so busy, to, and I was trying to rid myself of habits. I got delivered of certain things and certain things I needed to work through. I was trying to rid myself of certain habits that, that I was struggling with. So one night, I'm just going to fast forward this because I know the story is my life. Uh, so one night, I was working on some, some, um, some projects at school. And I thought to myself, man, I really want a bottle of wine. Um, I know none of y'all have ever drank a bottle before. I drank, I drank bottles of cheap wine. Um, so I said, I really want a bottle of wine. And my, uh, you know, Olivia is going to laugh at this, but... My, one of the things I crave is a Red Baron Supreme Pizza. I grew up poor. I ate a lot of frozen pizzas, and that, that was like the, the best frozen pizza you can get. So I said, man, I'm going to get myself a bottle of wine because I'm, st I'm still dealing with depression. I'm still trying to get through with this. At this point, I was drinking a 16-ounce glass of vodka in the morning and a 16-ounce gla glass of vodka at night before bed, and I was drinking a bottle, a big bottle, not, not those little normal bottles, but a big bottle of wine in the afternoon and night. Why? Because I was an alcoholic. So here I'm dealing with this. I went to this store, uh, neighborhood store. I walk in. I find my bottle of wine in the, in, the, in the fridge section. I get my pizza in the frozen section, and I'm walking out. You know, some of y'all heard this story before, and there's a point behind me telling this again. I'm walking out, you know, bottle in hand, pizza in the other hand, and, and I notice this big guy, big beard, he didn't even look like he showered in a long time. And he was stuffing, it looked like a butt of a gun down his shorts and he was looking around. God says, carjacker, audibly. Here I am, freshly saved, thinking, praise God you saved me. Carjacker, there's an exit on the other side. I'm gonna get home so I can drink my wine while it's cold and eat my pizza when it's hot before it, and, and stuff in the oven before it melts. And God said, give him a ride. 
How many of y'all would do that? Scare me to death. So here I am thinking to myself, I'm not hearing God's voice. I'm hearing the devil again. He's trying to kill me. I'm going to turn away. So as I turned away, God said, give him a ride. And I said, you are not God. God said, trust me. And I decided to trust. So I walk out to this guy. He turns and looks at me. He says, excuse me. And I said, wait, do you need a ride? And he goes, uh, what? Excuse me? And I said, look, do you need a ride? Do you, you want a ride, right? And he said, yes. And I said, well, come on. You're a lucky day. Hop in my truck. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm sweating bullets, thinking to myself, this is it. I'm martyred. I'm, I'm going to die tonight. But at least I'm dying pursuing God, right? So we get there, and, and I'm watching him. I get in first, and I said, this is my white Tacoma. And he, he, he turns the corner. I'm watching him at, the, at my mirror. And I see him take that, open his, his pants, and adjust that, the butt of that, of the, the handle of the 22 to his right side so he wouldn't, he wouldn't poke himself. And I was thinking to myself, God, if that's not you, God, protect me. <laughs> you know, he gets in, he sits down, and he just sits there quietly. Big dude. It's probably the height of, uh, of Scott. Big dude. But he was broad. And, and he gets in, he sits there quiet, and he goes, and I looked at him, I said, so? I grew up in the hood. So I was like, so? He goes, what? I said, where are you going? He goes, uh, what, what? And I said, where are we going? And I said, I'm giving you a ride. You need to tell me where you're going. And he goes, uh, hop on West Belfort and drive to Murphy Road. And I went, fine. I know exactly where that's at. And I'm thinking, I'm driving past my house right now. My brother's at home with a gun. I can call him. You know, I'm like, this guy's about to rob me. I'm going to die. And I'm driving. We get to Murphy Road. And I said, I stopped at the green light. And I said, where now? And he goes, excuse me? I said, where are Murphy Road? Where now? There are cars behind us. Tell me where to go. I wasn't this really sweet Christian. I was thinking to myself, I'm going to die. I'm, I'm going to give this man attitude. And he goes, take a right and go under 59. Fine. And I took a right and I said, where are we going now? And we're driving and driving. Murphy at that time wasn't as developed. It's still not that developed now if you all know the area. I'm driving down and I said, and he goes, uh, can I ask you a question? It's a deeper voice. My voice isn't as deep. And I said, what's up? And I'm driving there going, he's about to say, pull over, give me, your, give me your, your car. And he says, why are you giving me a ride? And I sat there, I shook my head, and I said, look, you won't believe me. And he goes, why are you giving me a ride? And I said, look, you really want to know? And I'm slowing down. And I said, you really want to know? And he says, yes. And I said, well, I'm a new Christian. I used to be Buddhist. And he's looking at me like, what the heck is this guy talking about? And I said, I, God told me that you wanted, you were, you wanted a ride. And, and then as soon as I said that, I saw a vision. And I said, you have a roommate? And he goes, yeah. And I said, you stood there in the middle of the living room in your apartment. You looked at your roommate and said, I'm going to get me a ride. And he goes, that's exactly what happened. Yes. And I said, well, I'm your ride. So where are we going? Now, he's probably thinking to himself, I wasn't talking about a, a drive. I was talking about a car because I grew up in the hood. When he said, I'm going to get me a ride, you, you're saying, I'm going to steal me a car or I'm going to carjack somebody. And he says, there's a dead end there. Just turn down the left on the next street. I, I take a left and he goes, pull over. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm dead. And he, as, soon as, as soon as I'm slowing down, before I stop, he opens the door and gets out and he says, just go. And I said, it's a dead end. Where are you going? And he goes, just, just go. And I was thinking about, so he goes, just go, son. And I went, all right. So I'm driving down a U-turn and I start speeding up because I'm thinking he's going to step in front of me and, and change his mind. And he, he looks at me, he lowers his head, starts shaking his head. And he raises his hands. I'm watching in the mirror. So now 16 years later, I remember asking God, hey, what, what's up with that? I believe God, God used me as an encounter for him. Right? Absolutely. He was he wanted to carjack somebody, but he got he got God jacked. <laughs> and luckily for me, I was allowed to go for the ride. Jeremiah seven twenty three, New King James Version. It says, "But this is what I command 
them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. And you shall be my people, and walk in all ways, all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Then in 1 Samuel 15, 22, I'm reading from the NLT. Samuel asks the question, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, Samuel says, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than the offering of fat of the fat of the rams. What motivates your actions? Your obedience to God or your need to prove your own righteousness? Wow. I've been there. True righteousness is found in the complete devotion to the one who is righteous. God makes us righteous. We can't make ourselves righteous. God makes us righteous. He made us righteous. He made us clean the very moment he died on that cross. And the very moment we said yes. Our righteousness has nothing to do with us except receiving it. Now, before I define motivation, let's first define three things. I'm going to define who we serve. That God states that you are either for him or against him. Really clear. That means you're, everything you do is either for him or against him. Meaning, you may be driven by self-serving motivations. However, what doesn't serve serves God serves the enemy. That means if you're driven by serving yourself, you're not serving God. You may reap the benefits of serving of worldly stuff by serving God. But that's not the point. The point is being the light, shining out, pointing out where he's at. When people are going through a hardship, it's like a flashlight. You go, Have you, do you see God there? The moment they say, yes, I've been there. I was broken. And they said, don't you see God saved you? I was, I was petrified with that carjacking. I called my friend who was a Christian. And I said, her name is Heather. I said, Heather, I got carjacked. She goes, oh my gosh. And I said, no, well, not really carjacked. God told me that I was going to get carjacked. She goes, what are you talking about? And I just said, well, I gave her my ride. And she goes, are you with them right now? And I was like, no, 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 I'm not. I dropped them off. And she said, so you were carjacked. I said, I was carjacked. She said, no, you weren't. And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, tell me what happened. I told you, told her the same story. She said, you realize God used you to touch someone's life? She said, you're a new Christian. I said, do you realize how scary that was? And I was like, I don't think I can go to bed. I finished my wine already. I, I'm freaked out. Number two, where, we, where do you store your treasures? This is a vital question. Those who do good through obedience to God will live for all eternities with the treasures that God stores up. You know the greatest treasure of them all in heaven? Being face to face with our maker. A lot of people are saying, gosh, wait until I can't wait to see my mansion. I'm thinking, man, you've got it wrong. My mansion is God. My treasure is God. It's being in his presence. And you know what's even greater? He's here. I'm in his presence. And his presence is in you. When I look out, God is on you and in you. And that's so beautiful. We're in the treasure. We're, 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 we're living from a position of victory. We're living from a posi position that, that we're already reaping the benefits of the treasures of heaven. So where do you store your treasures? Number three, how do you define sacrifice? The way I, I measure it, the way God showed me to measure my sacrifices is, what do I have to gain? You may have something to gain when God tells you to do something. That's great. In most instances, you may not see your gain until later. Because his gain, his kingdom, growing his kingdom, is so much more important than growing our arm. So when we're making decisions, when we, as soon as we wake up, the first question that pops in our mind is, who do I choose today that I will serve? And we need to move from that truth. 
And you know how the simplest way to do that? It's the same thing we preach every Sunday is we include him in every decision we make. And that glorifies him. That's a worship. When he's included, we're, it becomes a sweet incense because we're listening and we're obeying. We're saying, you know, you, you know my ways. No, you know which ways I should go. And I will follow. We must be driven through reckless, reckless devotion to the one that wrecked his own life, wrecked his own body, wrecked his own reputation for us. And only then are we going to produce spiritual fruit. Only then will the treasures of heaven pile up and multiply. And the treasures are for now. Like I mentioned before, the true treasure is knowing Jesus Christ. Man, I think Scott and I, we had dinner the other night. If that's all I received... Salvation and speaking to him. That is, that is greater than I deserve. There's going to be a large bounty of spiritual fruit that's produced through our, through our reckless obedience. And that large bounty of spiritual fruit is going to be evidence to the world of God's goodness, not our own. Sacrifice most believe is a good thing, but I'm saying sacrifice through obedience is greater. Like with all actions or motivations for sacrifice supersedes the actual act of sacrificing. When sacrifice, we much examine our own motives through the inclusion of the Holy Spirit. You may have something to gain and again, great if the Holy Spirit guides you to that sacrifice. And then if the Holy Spirit guides you to sacrifice where you visually doesn't, it doesn't look like you have anything to gain, great, you're being obedient. Had a friend that was going through a hardship, financial hardship. She received this huge lump sum from her tax return because she was a single mom of two. And she began to celebrate. She took my friend and I out in our ministry to bless us. She took out other friends, gave away money, bought things. She's bought this $2,000 Sony camera back then, which your, I think your cell phone shoots better camera photos now. You know, she did all these things. Second month, she called me crying. I'm two months behind on all my bills. They're going to they're gonna repo my, my car. They're going to kick me out of my house. And I said, how much are your bills every month? I was going to give her a loan. The moment she told me, she said, in another two weeks, I'll be three months behind. She told me, I multiply that number. That was the exact number she received from her tax return. Mm -hmm. So God not only caught her up, he paid for two more months. Mm -hmm. And I pointed that out to her and she freaked out. She was like, well, it's too late now. What's there? There's no point. And I said, the point is when he does it again, ask him what to do with the money. Right. Yeah. Pure sacrifices made through pure obedience may not always yield worldly possession or comforts but they will always produce spiritual fruit and heavenly riches. I've shared this story before. When I was running my own design firm, about a year into it, I went three months without an income. My design firm would bring in $100 in a month and then bring in $100,000 a month later. Three months later, I had nothing. I had $250 left to my name. I went out to a Christian uh, youth group to hang out. I was about $25,000 behind in bills, my, my personal bills, my office bills, my payroll. A lot of these things, you know, those have ever owned a business and you had employees, you have a payroll to meet and they become like your children. You want to take care and give them their, their basically their allowance. But I'm leaving this, this place. We sit down, a big group of us. It was probably 18 of us, 15 to 18 people. And God said, pay for the table. I had $250 left to my name. I looked at everyone, I counted it, added in my, 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 I was a bad tipper at that time, now I'm a great tipper. Christians should be the best tipper, tippers. But here I am, I'm sitting there looking down and I counted everyone, I said, that's about $245. I am gonna be living on Raymond noodles until I'm kicked out. <laughs> and then I said, can't do it. I ordered a tiny appetizer for myself and God said, nope, 
pay for everyone. And finally, I leaned over and I said, I have to be obedient. Let me pay for everyone. I wear spirit. I pay for it secretly. And everyone was like, who paid for us? No one, no one raised their hand. And I was like, I don't know. Anyways, I'm walking out. I'm in my car about to cry, driving home, going, I'm almost on E. I have, luckily, I have two cases of ramen noodles. The Asian kind, which is better than American ramen noodles. So I'm pulling off. I'm pulling home, and the next morning I wake up. I get to my design firm. I just get there at 5 a.m. I sit down, and the phone rings. This is, I think his name is David something. This is David whatever. Is this Zen Design Studios? Yes, it is. I have a $25,000 check. Is, is that enough for, and he named everything he needed. And I said, that's more than enough. That's about $10,000 worth of work, I said. He goes, well, I've got $25,000. And I was like, I understand you have $25,000. It won't be fair for me to charge you $25,000. He says, well, I'm dropping off the check now. Is that, an, is that enough? And I said, yes, it's exactly enough. You want to keep arguing. If you want to pay me more, fine. I had a client one time when I was, when I had to close, I was about to close down. They called me a big supermarket chain. It's Houston based. They called me and said, what if we tripled your monthly payment? Can you stay open? I said open for two more years. But anyways, I did this. He comes over, he hands me the check. I looked down and I went, that is a great interest rate yes. from doing being obedient. Mm -hmm. I had something to gain from it. I didn't know. Paid off everything. My, uh, my employee payroll were two, two payments behind. Paid them all off. I told employees. Next week, same thing. We're out eating. And God says, pay for the table. I sat at a bigger table just in case. Three, uh, it was about, ended up at $358. And I gave him a fat tip. Because I was like, I wonder if it's going to happen again. Mm. The next step Monday, $40,000 project came in. He, he said, I, I, I used to take 30% up front. I demand that I pay half up front. And I said, I'm okay with that. I was like, well, I don't understand these people. Third week, same thing. Fourth week, I get there. I sat at the biggest table and I, I leaned over before hearing God. I'm paying for everybody. And God said, did I ask you? And I said, I already told the waiter. This interest rate thing is going to be awesome. And I said, I'm sitting at a table with like 40 people. I'm going to have a forty dollars or $50,000 check the next day. Next day, nothing came. Why? The first three times I did it was out of pure obedience. Even though I needed to take a, a leap of faith. The fourth time, selfishness. Because I thought God was going to build my business by the way I gave. God, was, God actually will build your business and your ministry and your life and your family to how you obey. It's such an idol opener for me. We need to become people whose life emulates the life, the life of the one who saved us. We need to become people whose sole desire is to serve our Heavenly Father with every decision we make. We must transition from believers to followers. God's children who, are, who live intentionally with unwavering obedience and un unselfish sacrifices. Unwavering obedience and unselfish sacrifices. I changed the words as I was reading it. Um, but it's true. What if we moved with unwavering obedience? I heard it, therefore I'll do it. He said to give, therefore I'll give. He may tell you, hey, you get a tax, big fat tax refund, go to Disney World. If you do, ask God if you can take me. But go and enjoy it. If he says enjoy it, enjoy it. Do not, don't feel guilty about it. When he says give it, give it. And give it cheerfully. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, I'm reading from the New King James. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does, does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me that, that day, Lord, Lord, we have, have, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The only law we keep 
is obedience to God. We do as he tells us to do. And it's clear here that miracle signs and wonders can happen to unbelievers. Yes. But it's so much better to do it as a believer. Because when you're an unbeliever, you're doing it in Jesus' name. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you're a mature Christian. I tell people that all the time. When I first started speaking, I said, just because I, I can prophesy over you and I can read your mail and I can call out specific dates and stuff does not make me a mature Christian. Don't follow me, follow God. And if God leads you here, come. If God doesn't, don't. Don't follow the man, follow the spirit. We are called to follow Christ. And I say we follow him with our eyes fixed on him so we don't miss a turn. I've missed turns. I don't want you all to miss any. I've seen God go a certain way and I said, no. I'm going to go that way and I'll end up at the same location. Five years later, I was there when it could have taken me less than a year. Detours. You don't want any detours. So when you wake up this when you wake up in the morning tomorrow, ask yourself, who will I serve today? Then live the, out your day with the one you serve on mine. With your heart, your mind, your lips, and your actions. Speak according to the one you serve. <laughs> Think according to the one you serve. If you get thoughts in there that don't that don't belong, grab them captive and cast them out. Love according to the one you serve. Let all your actions show off your amazing God. Today we're called to expand God's kingdom on earth and destroy the enemy's kingdom. And the more obedient we are, the faster that kingdom breaks down. You have people you want saved? Be obedient. You want breakthrough at your work? Be obedient. Have a cheerful heart. You want breakthrough in your family and friends, in your ministry, be obedient. Ask God, hey, am I doing something you didn't ask me to do? It may be something that looks great on the outside. Or ask God, hey, was there an unpure motive here? Anything, any motive not set by God is an impure motive. Is there an unimpure un, un, motive here in my actions? So important. This is for this is this is how you live a successful Christian life by walking according to the Spirit and only the Spirit. Read His Word, speak to the Word, and and do according to the Word. The Word is Jesus Christ. Do according to the what the Word puts on your heart. Well, thank you all for listening. Thank you everyone who's online who's joined us, and also thank you all for the support. We love y'all. Okay.